this book here is both the most loved and most hated book in all of history. It is the most printed book and even the first ever printed book in all of history. This book has shaped nations around the world as we have them today, including Europe and America. If it was not for this book, the nations that we see as the first world countries today would not be who they are for they were shaped by the ideas in this book. But today we see that this book is becoming more and more irrelevant in a culture that is largely against it, largely opposing it and, and pushing ideas in contradiction to it. And as these other ideas become more prevalent and more um, important in the minds of men, these become less important because this book is seen as a danger to ideas that contradict it, right? But see, friends, here's the thing. America or any country that you may think of as a worthy and good country in the world today would not exist. And all the good that is in these countries would not exist if it was not for this book. When we look at countries around the world who have abandoned the ways laid out in this book, lay, abandoned the Bible and the truth set therein, they have become the most devastating countries that this world is facing. When we look at a lot of the Middle East, when we look at countries like China, those are war torn countries where more people are dying than anywhere else in the world. While all the countries, 100% of the countries who are absolutely truly upholding the values in this book are countries where there is peace in, are countries where there is freedom in. Doesn't the evidence speak louder than any ideas we can try and put down on the table? The evidence is abundant in abundance that there is something to this book and there is a reason it is the most famous book in the world. And even though the Bible has had the most biggest impact on society today, versus any other document or grouping of ideas. There is a drought in the Western world. There is a drought in America. And you may say, PD, what do you mean a drought? We have an abundance of water at this moment. And I'll say not a drought of water, a drought of his word. The Bible that radically impacted and changed and was the foundation of the building of nations has been forgotten by the generation we are standing in today. The generations today only have a surface level understanding of the Bible because they only know what someone has told them about it. They have not become intimately familiar with it like their ancestors were. Because see, if you don't have a personal, intimate relationship with the Bible and the God who gave it, then you will never be able to come back and understand why is it that the success of this land is so in abundance. Instead, what we do is we are growing and growing in ignorance of what is written therein. And so because the human nature is in opposition to God and in opposition to his ideas, that's by the way, why the Bible is not written by men, because men would never write the things in the Bible. That is why when we start separating from God, we start separating from his word and the Bible, we start separating from the ideas therein. And so what we do is we start bundling together with people around us with the same carnal ideas. And you know what the human nature is and how people think is they think that if there are people around them who agree with them, then they must be right. Because no one in the world believes something that they know is wrong. You would go and change your beliefs into what you think is right, what seems right to a man. But the question is, is, is that what is truth? Because truth is an absolute thing. It's not something it can change with the times. 
You see, brothers and sisters, the times and the seasons and the ages we enter can become darker and darker and more evil. But you don't get to darken his word. You don't get to change it. You don't get to say, well, the culture is going this way. So this and that part of it becomes irrelevant. You don't get to do that. You see, God calls people who are an all or nothing people. That was the message of Jesus all the time. His message was, you want to follow me? Well, make sure that you have left everything behind before you even think of doing so. And don't dare picking and choosing which part of me you desire and want. And so what we have done is we have created 33,000 plus denominations, 33,000 ways to God. There is, is what the world says. But God said, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am. He says, I am. And no one comes to the Father except through him, through Jesus. No one. You can't come to God through the Catholic Church. You can't come to God through the Baptist Church. You can't come to God through the Lutherans. You can't come to God through the Charismatics. You can't come to God through a man. This or that pastor. You come to God through Jesus himself, not picking and choosing a part of him that you like and throwing out the rest, because that's what a denomination is. The denominations of God are groups of people who have come to say we want to follow God. But we want to pick and choose like a recipe, make a recipe, a pick and choose the ingredients we want of Jesus and put that in our meal. But the rest of it, we don't want. So we'll throw it out on the side. And you know what we do as believers, as Christians, as, and we have done this history tells the tale is that what happens first is we see culture start adopting an idea, something that is far out evil, something that the Bible very clearly prohibits. And we will be like, no, that's wrong. We won't do that. And as the years go on and go by, we start compromising. We start changing our mind. We say, you know what? Maybe it's not that bad. You know, maybe the Bible was written to for the people of 2000 years ago and not for the people of today or certain aspects of it is not as relevant for today anymore. And then we start throwing out something like the law of God, the instructions of God, which many churches have already done. Or we say, well, some things were only for then for certain reasons and it's not for today anymore that we don't need to walk like Jesus in every way. We only walk like him in the ways that are applicable to us today, right? And then we start throwing out other pieces of him, like the Holy Spirit and how he walked in power. You see, our human nature is to ultimately follow the flesh, to ultimately follow or what seems right to us instead of what is right, because we simply don't know God. Because here's the thing, Adam and Eve, they didn't truly know God, even though they were in his presence, they, they were spoiled with him. But they didn't even know him. They weren't worthy. They weren't able to walk like he did because they had prideful desires. They wanted to lift up what they thought is beautiful. And that is for them to be exalted instead of for them to be made humble and meek. For their desires to be put aside was too great of a thing for them. And that's why today, when we talk about something like you, you must abstain from sex before marriage or you cannot go into a marriage thinking that there is an exit in the back called divorce or ideas such as this or that pornography is OK in moderation and or that it is a healthy thing. When we talk about these ideas, it seems OK. It seems like as long as I don't hurt anyone, as long as my sin doesn't hurt anyone and I don't murder or I don't, you know, directly impact someone like that, then it's OK. What's what's wrong with it? Right. And we start making up these excuses because we have such a lack of knowledge. It's like a little baby 
telling mom and dad, I don't want to do this and that just because the child does not understand the impact because the child is not mom and dad. The child hasn't been on earth for a while to see what the impacts are of its wrongdoing. And that's how we are. We are like children. We are like babies. And the sooner you understand you're like a child, like a baby, the sooner you'll understand your position and that you don't know what you're talking about when it comes to right and wrong, apart from what the word of God, what the Bible says, because it was given by God. God is the only adult in the room. He is the only one who knows the true depths of our actions. He's the only one who truly understands the consequences, even to the second and third generation of our action, which we thought would have zero impact even on our own life. You think that little bit of pornography you watch there on the side is going to have no impact on your children and their children. You are so deceived and you have eaten what Satan has fed you. Brothers and sisters, there is a drought in America, like I said, and that drought is one of a people who are starving and they don't even know it. You know, like when you are so thirsty, but you don't even understand your thirst until the moment that you see a glass of water on the table. That's how we are in America. People are dying of their thirst but they don't even know it because they've never had a drink of water. They don't even know that it is the water that they need to drink that will satisfy them. And that water is God. See, you will never know what is the lack in your heart and the unfulfillment. You will know there's something missing. You will know there's something wrong, but you won't know what it is. You will go to all kinds of things to try and fill that desire. You will go to movies. You will go to pornography. You will go to video games, you will go to relationships, you will go to a marriage, you will get children, you will try and get a nice car, a nice house and riches and drugs and all of these things, the next music festival, the next party. And you will and all of these things you say, well, Pete, you're speaking as if these things are all evil, not all of them are, but all of them are evil when you try and use them to fill you up. Because see, you think that you will find fulfillment and freedom and satisfaction in those things. Those things are empty. There is nothing in them that will satisfy you apart from the moment after you purchase them, where you have a moment of thinking, this is the thing that's going to make me feel better. You buy it, you go get into it, you do whatever it is. And you're like, this is it. And, and that moment, that first second, you have a sense of satisfaction because you think you hit the jackpot. And then as the minutes roll by, your heart drops as you realize. I still feel empty. Something's still missing. I'm still thirsty. Let's see. Jesus said, whoever drinks of me will never go thirsty again. He spoke to a woman at a well who was busy drawing water. She was drawing water because she knew that if she drank water, her thirst would be quenched. But she didn't know that her eternal thirst that a hold in her heart would only be quenched by Jesus. And that's why he said, if you drink of this water, you'll go thirsty again. But if you drink of me, you will never go thirsty again. You will forever be satisfied in what I give you. And I know you don't want to listen. I know you don't want to hear it because you've heard it before. You don't want to hear that Jesus is the answer because you have a self-righteous spirit. You think that you are right and you think that the works that you have are enough and the things you participate in are enough. And you deceive yourself every time you go on that binge of alcohol to think that that is enough. That is what is going to fill me up this time. And you will return to that bottle or you will return to whatever that thing is because you think that it's if I just go one more time, I'm going to feel better. Or if I just get rid of my marriage, I'm going to feel better. If I just get rid of 
this or that thing, I'm going to feel better. You see, you go, went into the marriage thinking this is going to fix you. Now you're going out of the marriage thinking that's what's going to fix you. You're deceived because only God is what the thing is that's going to fix you. Not, it's not your wife's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your children's fault. I don't care who hurt you, how bad they hurt you. That is not the thing that has caused how you feel to be how you feel. It is the fact that you have no relationship with God, even though you sit in the front row seat in church. You think that's the thing that will fulfill you. You think that it is having a Bible and reading it that is going to fill you. You say, well, Petey, what is the solution? Then you, you say it's the Bible. You say it's God. You see, here's the thing. I can read this Bible. I can know it. There are people who go to seminary and they spend years of their life studying it and they get it become experts, PhDs in it. And then they'll go ahead and write a book about it. That is in total contradiction to it because they may have the knowledge of what this says, but they don't have knowledge of who the one is who truly wrote it because they have no personal relationship with them. You see, if there was such a thing as books that were written about my wife, about her likes, her dislikes, about how she grew up and a book that detailed everything about her life. And I would go and I would become a PhD reading that book about this topic, about who my wife is. Yet, unless I have actually met her, Unless I have actually had a relationship with her, unless I have actually become her husband and grew closer to her in all the ways that there is in marriage, unless all that happens, I don't really know her. I don't know her as well as I can to be able to say that I am married to her. I can know all the books. I can know all the knowledge about her. But I need to know her. You can have everything that you want about God, but you need to know God. And that is not just a, there are people who read the Bible, who read the Torah, but deny Jesus. There are people who read the Bible every day, but live like hell. Because they don't know him because you can have knowledge about him, but not know him. You can have knowledge about me, but not know me. You can have knowledge about the president, but not know the president. But the question is, when you pitch up to the president's White House, are they going to say, put a gun to you and say, who, what are you doing here? You're not allowed in here. Or are they going to say, welcome, the president knows you come on in. When you get to the gates of heaven one day and you will stand before that, you will come to God. And you, when you appear before him, is he going to call his guards, his angels to take you away because he doesn't know you? Or is he going to say, I know you. And he's going to call you by name up and he's going to give you the reward of a seat at his table. You see, the people at his table aren't going to be people who just know the Bible. They're not going to be people who even sit in the front row seat of church every and never misses a Sunday. They're going to be people like the disciples who dwell with Jesus, because that's what he said. He said, you will dwell with me. You will dine with me in the kingdoms. So what was it about the disciples? You see, if we were still only going to go on what the world would think would be the man who would sit at that table with Jesus. It would be the Pharisees of the first century. They were the most learned of the learned. They had all the books memorized. They had it all, all the knowledge about the Bible, if you will, the Torah back then. They had all of it down. But when Jesus walked among them, they couldn't recognize him. When love walked among them, they could not recognize it. How is that? They didn't. No, God, only about him. They fooled themselves into thinking that they know God, 
even. They thought, they were convinced that they do, but they didn't. They had no idea who he was. You see, brothers and sisters, here is the thing. Here's the secret. You do not truly know God until you have love. Until you say, Father, God, I have no love. And when you realize that you don't have love and you are in the place where you're able to say, where you're humble enough, because that's the thing that stops people is pride from admitting they don't have love. You see what I oftentimes see, I see people who know everything. They know the Bible so well. They know every jar and turtle. They know the Torah. They know the New Testament. They know every argument. They can win every debate. And I myself was in that place where I thought those are the things that would qualify me before men and God. But yet they don't have love. And when you tell them you don't have love, they'll say, well, I do have love because love is telling everyone how wrong they are. Love is going and smacking someone over the head with a Bible to prove to them how right we are and how wrong they are. Actually, that's not what love is. And I'm not talking about a greasy, greasy love here before you get on the comments and tell me I'm going to do that. I, I, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the true love of the Bible, the kind of love that our father had for his people. You see, God said, if you love me, you will do what I told you to do. It's very important. What was the last thing he told us to do before he left? To love your neighbor. Because see, when you love your neighbor, that is how you love God. And I'm specifically talking about the Great Commission. What he said is to his disciples just before he ascended. Before he left, last thing he says, guys. You have denied me. You are my disciples, yet you did not believe I was raised. You did not believe the testimony of those who said I came and I'm back. It, the, the scriptures say that he reproached their unbelief. And then he said, now go out into the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Are you going out into the world and proclaiming the gospel to every creature? And I'm not talking about trying to win Facebook arguments. That's not what he said to do. Because you're back to your pride, then. You're back to trying to prove to everyone how right you are and how wrong they are. That's not what he told you to do. He didn't ask you to answer questions. He didn't ask you to answer debates and win debates. He told you to answer people and win people. You see the difference? The one is about me being right. The one is about how holy I am. The other is about how lost the other person is and how badly we want to get them back for the kingdom. A few weeks ago, I heard someone say. God never asked us to love his enemies. And this is testimony, this idea that is now spreading even is just testimony of how lost people are because they think that love is something that's exclusively for those who love them back. And that's exactly what the Pharisees who rejected Yeshua thought love is. That's why he had to come and correct them. He told them, you have heard it said, love those who love you back. I told you no. What profit is there to love those who simply love you back? It does not even the sinners and unbelievers and atheists and new agers and those in witchcraft alike do the same. They love their spouses, their own families, their children. That's easy to do. But I tell you, love those who hate you, who reject you who despitefully use you, who are your enemies, who would set up traps for you, who would backstab you, who would leave you on the side to die. 
love them. Because then you will show the true love of the Father. And that will be the thing that demonstrates the Holy Spirit is in you. That will be the thing that demonstrates you are worthy of sitting at His table. Because that is what He did for you. That is what He did for all of this world. He went to that cross with people spitting on him. And those are the people who, if they were to turn around and repent, they would be um, have access to his sacrifice. The very thing that they caused. They were the ones who whipped him. They were the ones who crucified him, put spears through him, cursed at him, hated him. And then he turns around and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You see, from the beginning, what man has always tried to do is we have tried to have gods that are formed into the likeness of what we want them to be. Whether in ancient times, as it were, we had gods of stone and wood, which we carved into how we want them to be. And we made them think what we want them to think and say what we want them to say because we spoke on their behalf because they were mute and blind and deaf. They had no thoughts or actions. But we like the idea of having some higher power as long as we can control it. We like the idea of having a God as long as we have dominion over what that God does and says and does in our life. We absolutely dislike the fact that the one true God is not in our control. We don't like the fact that he has a word that is unchanging and at enmity with our carnal nature. That's why we want to change it. People have wanted to throw away the Bible for as long as they could. As long as since, since it's been given, people have tried to pick and choose about it. That's why we have the denominations we spoke about. That's why we have Catholicism. That's why we have Lutherism. That's why we have Protestantism. A lot of those things were born from good ideas and hearts, but a lot of it is also from the evil carnality of the human nature that simply wants to uphold certain aspects of God while throwing out the rest. Whether it is upholding the beautiful aspect of his Holy Spirit, his miracles and how he still does miracles in and through us today or and then throwing out the, the, the truth part, the law, the obedience, the fact that we need to actually be holy. Or the fact that we then we love holiness. We want to keep holiness. We want to be holy. But then we throw out the Holy Spirit. We quench it. We say it's not for today anymore. Or we try and make up new traditions. And we let that those tradition quench the actual commandments of God. Like we celebrate feast days he has not commanded. And we've thrown out the feast days he did. Whatever it is, we try and make God in our image. But God made us in his. You see, brothers and sisters, God is not there to be formed by you. He is the one who forms you. You are made in his image. He is not made in yours like our idols are. And so that means that what clay how is its maker? How do you form me? Stop forming me like that. Form me more like this. Do it more this way. Make me more like that. No. Rather, the maker forms the clay the way he wants it. And if the clay is hardened, if the clay has been has become so hard that the maker is unable to form it anymore, if that clay is hard hearted, does that maker not throw it into the fire, toss it aside and pick up new clay to form? Yes, he does. Watch out that you don't become like a rock in your father's hand when you don't allow him to form you into what he wants you to be. The world wants you to be something useless, like a rock. But he wants to mold you into something that is beautiful, that has use, that has value. A rock is no val no, has no value. But when there is a pot that has been beautifully crafted by a craftsman, molded, there is immense value in it. And so similarly, you intrinsically, you do have value. As you land in your father's hands, you have immense 
value. But the moment that you leave his hands because you are unformable, that is when you lose value. That time, that day when you become unformable only arrives the day you die. And the day you die is when the clock stops ticking, when your time is up and whatever is, is forever. And if you land in the pile of trash of unformable pieces of clay, that is what you will be. But that is not who you were made to be. That is God doesn't make mistakes. It is your choice. It is what you will do with yourself, what you will do with your life, whether you will allow yourself to be molded. What will you do with your life? Because if you are a piece of clay as you are in your father's hands, and instead of resisting, instead of having a hard, prideful heart, you say, Father, here I am. Mold me in whichever way you desire. Use me as a tool in your hand in whichever way you want. Because I want to reach the fullness of my value, potential or purpose in life. And when you do that, that's when you're satisfied. That's when you're filled. That's when you're going to reach everything you were made to reach. But there's no other way to that. You can't use any other means except telling God, do what you want. And so brothers and sisters, the reason that this message is what I am making for you today is that there is a spirit of self-righteousness, a Pharisaic spirit over America that is causing this drought. A spirit that is telling people, a demonic spirit that is telling people that you are OK, you are filled and you can continue in all these other things and you will be fine. And the spirit tells people that you don't need the instructions of God because they're outdated. You don't need to follow the Bible because it's outdated. You need to spend time each and every day with your father. Just reading the Bible is not going to do it. That's important. That is amazing. That has got incredible value because it helps with the renewing of our minds more into his image. It's important. But don't be deceived to think that as long as I just read my little bit of Bible, I'm fine because that's not what a relationship is. I can live with a wife, but if I just read this book about her, but I never speak to her, I never spend time with her. I never do things for her to show my love for her. I can tell her I love her as much as I want, but my words are empty and powerless. Right? It is when I actually go on dates with her. It is when I actually speak with her every single day to cultivate our relationship that there is a relationship. People divorce often because they have no relationship. And similarly, you will be divorced from God if you have no relationship. Sooner or later, it will happen. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until that clock hits 12 and the time is up. Don't wait because it will soon be too late. And brothers and sisters, here's the thing is if this was the moment right now, this right here, this is the moment you die. Are you going to be happy with your life? Are you going to say, wow, I died and I ran the race with everything I had. Everything I had to give to God, I did. I told God to mold me. I told him to use me. And as he has used me and as he has molded me, I have always allowed it. I have never hardened myself to his hand. I have never stood in his path. I have never let my flesh come in his way of having his way in me. But I have always bowed the knee. I have done what he told me to do, even though it was the hardest thing ever. I have done it. And with that, I am satisfied with my life. I am fulfilled. Or are you going to think, Wow, I wish, I wish, I wish that I did things differently. That I spend a little bit more time with God every day so I can actually hear his voice when he spoke. I wish that I could actually read my Bible more and 
done the things that were important for my life. You see, what use is it to live the American dream, raise your family and even do a good job at it, yet not know God? What use is it to gain the whole world, but not know God? Because then you lose your own soul. Then you lose everything you were made to actually be raising a family and doing those things responsibly is what any godly man would do. And that is good. But it is your relationship with God that will matter. Because from that, seek first the kingdom of God and the rest will be added to you. The rest will fall into place. The rest will happen. You will be able to do the rest after you seek the kingdom of God. But you cannot do the rest unless you have it. You can deceive yourself into thinking you've got it, but you don't truly have it. Now, so brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with that. This, you're on a plane that's about to take off and you know this plane will not land. You know this plane will crash. Are you happy with that? Are you happy with the fact that if you die today, it's done, it's over? Or are you going to say, God, no, please don't let this plane crash because the reason is I'm not ready to see you today. My life isn't in order. I'm not ready. Let your life be in order because no one knows the day or the hour of his coming, but even more, no one knows the day or the hour of your death. It can be before this video ends. It can be tomorrow. It can be this afternoon or tonight in your sleep. No one knows the day or the hour when you will be gone. And when you are gone, I hope that you won't be sorry. Because one thing that will never change is the truth in this word. And the last page in this Bible that tells us the following. I, Yeshua, have sent my messenger to witness to you these matters in the assemblies. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And he who hears, let him say, come. And he who thirsts, come. And he who desires to take the water of life without paying. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. It's been paid for with the life of God himself. When he came to lay it down for you, all you need to do is come. That's why he say the bride says, come. The spirit says, come. Everyone screams, come. For the water, for those who are thirsty, come to drink and you will be satisfied. And I just pray right now, Father, God, that you would come. Everyone who watches this, who are thirsty, everyone who wants more, Lord, everyone who feels uneasy about their life, who feel like they haven't been molded, they haven't allowed themselves to be molded. Father, come. Lord, right now, Lord, I thank you from this video will be rivers of living water, Lord, right now for every thirsty soul. In the name of Yeshua, right now, in the name of Jesus, there will be freedom right now, Lord. I thank you. God, I thank you for filling them up. I thank you, Lord, that you quench every thirst. I thank you that you answer the prayers. And Lord, right now, every prayer that goes up to you, Father, for everyone who desires to be molded, for everyone who doesn't want to harden themselves against you anymore. I thank you. You have mercy and grace. And you say the time is not up. There is time. Come to me and I will fill you and satisfy you. Come to me. I'm not angry at you. Come to me. I'm not hate. I'm not hating you. Come to me. I love you instead. I like on the way to the cross. Say, Father, they don't know what they did. So forgive them. Brothers and sisters, Paul, the apostle, killed believers. He was a murderer. He was against the kingdom of God in a way that few would ever rival. Yet he said because of his ignorance and unbelief in God, God had mercy even on him. And so if he could make it and still be used as mightily as he was, nothing prohibits you 
nothing, no sin, nothing you've done, nothing, no matter how much anyone has treated you, no matter how much you've been abused, no matter what depression you have, no matter what sin you have, no matter what trauma you have or bondage you have or addiction you have, nothing can separate you from the love of God. If you come and say, Father, I am thirsty and I need a drink of you. Come and have a drink of his joy. Because his joy is what fills you up and makes you whole. His joy is what will give you freedom from all your bondages. May he fill you truly. Shalom.